everyone and welcome to today's webinar which is hosted by Ted Woods. My name is Kate and I am part of Kubla Software's business development team. So just a bit of admin before we begin, you can write your comments and any questions that you have in the Q&A. Um, so that might pop up automatically on the side of your screen or if you click the speech bubble with the question mark in, um, then this will um, bring up the, the Q&A and you can ask your questions um, from there. So at the end of Ted's demonstration, there will be the um, Q&A session where he'll answer those questions um, as many as he can as possible. Um, and then any that he isn't able to answer or we don't have time for, uh, we'll try and respond in an email. Okay, so I'll now pass you over to Ted, who will demonstrate to you how to create the cut and fill estimations for a housing project. OK, thanks, Kate, uh, for the introduction and uh, welcome to everyone uh, to this presentation. So um, just some background, we've been working with uh, a lot of uh, house builders uh, to establish a workflow that works well with using Kubla Cubed. Um, so we did a presentation about this in Digital Construction Week, week in London um, some months ago. And so I thought it'd be a good idea to do a like online webinar as well, because um, it's quite a popular topic and quite a a big challenge. So what I do with the, any project is I always start with the site plan. So we've got a site plan um, that we can start with. So obviously a lot of people won't, will be working with PDF files rather than uh, CAD site plans. This one's a CAD site plan. Um, everything I do in this uh, tutorial will be uh, just as true for tracing as it is for, for extracting from CAD, but it, it takes a lot longer to trace or in, in in Cooper Cube now we've now got this PDF vector extraction technology, um, but the fastest way still is to use, or the most problem free often is to use CAD. So the concepts are the same, but you might you might be having to think when I'm extract importing from CAD that you'll be maybe having to trace or try and extract from PDF PDF vectors. So here's a typical housing project, uh, and I'll talk about some of the challenges that you have. So basically, it's broken down into uh, building pads, which often have this uh, finished level marked, uh, so marked as FFL. And you also maybe have garages, which might be, might have an elevation that's similar, that's kind of like similar to this um, one, like in relation, sometimes it's like maybe half a foot lower or something like that. Uh, so there's a garage and then there's this shared drive that goes to the road. Uh, so the problem with housing projects, like this is quite simple, project in a in Kubla cubed like a residential project but the problem is you have just so many different housing plots like we have sometimes projects where there's a hundred so you need a workflow establish a workflow that you sort of know works um, at scale so this is the workflow that we recommend which is robust and could get the results that you need so another thing in housing projects is people want want the different separation of cut and fill they want cut and fill for the building pads maybe for the gardens the, the roads, the footpaths. So you need a workflow that works well with that, which is maybe slightly different to, to what a lot of you have been doing. Some some projects maybe, uh, and this is kind of a standard approach, are you do a set of contours for your proposed, and then you do adjustment areas using reduce elements. So uh, you adjust down to the formation level, sometimes called subgrade level from that. So everything is in one group and then you adjust down. That's not so great for these kind of projects because it's very difficult to define building plots and garages and things with contours. You need extremely dense uh, contours to do that. So we've got a slightly different approach here, which we'll, we'll go through. So uh, without further ado, I'll start by adding the uh, site plan into Kubla Cubed. Uh, so that's most of you might know this is like you just click on the plans menu and then we're adding a cat if it was a pdf you'd be choosing the top option but we've got a cat font so we're choosing the second option and then we select uh, the dwg now with a pdf you'd now need to scale uh, by either a ratio or known length with a cat file we already have the uh, the uh, metadata which says the units but even with cad it's definitely worth checking using a scale and the measure tool which you uh, do by holding down m and measuring so like here we can say that's 50 um 50 meters so that's scale correctly in cad you're used to just checking it whereas in with a pdf obviously it doesn't have that information so you have to scale it first and then check it 
the other thing to mention is that this project, for due to time constraints, we've just got it in one CAD file. Often you might be stitching uh, different ones together on a housing project. You might have this section, one PDF, another PDF here, another one here, another one here. Um, and the same is true for CAD, actually, you can often have different CAD files. In that case, you would need to use this align to two points to align the plans together or crop. Um, but this one is nice and simple, so we just click OK, um, and we're ready to start doing our existing takeoff. OK, so that's the site plan in the project. So the first step, obviously, is to do the existing. So uh, the existing here is marked with contour lines. Uh, usually there'll be contour lines or points on, uh, or sometimes both. So we start with a feature surface. So feature surface is what's used for um, adding in points and contour lines and breaks. You might use a triangle surface if you had defined a surface in another program, uh, like, like Autodesk CAD or something like that. But we obviously have the contours, points and break um, in the plan. So we're clicking on feature surface. And then there's four buckets up here. So we need to import or trace the relevant entities or uh, elevation features into the individual buckets. I'll start by just uh, tracing an outline. Uh, so one thing to note about the existing is you don't want to um, try and define your existing outline strictly around the disturbance area, which, which is something that we notice new users do quite a lot. You want to define like a, a large amount of existing because you define your disturbance area in your proposed elements, not in your existing. And there's some advantage of having a larger existing like here because it makes the visualizations look better. And also um, it's more flexible. So if you had wanted to change the position of this road, it would be better if there was existing there already. You wouldn't have to go back and define the existing again. So in this one, I'm, I'm going to find, or even if I was tracing, I'd probably define all of it because it wouldn't take too much time, um, as well as as well as the stuff over the disturbance area, obviously. So there's a few different uh, types of boundary outline, we call them. Um, in the existing, I'm using extrapolate. We'll go over some of the other options later. So extrapolate, this is kind of floating in space, and then it will take its, its elevations from contained elevation features, in this case, contours. So I've traced an extrapolate outline there. Now I'm going to go through just extracting these contours from CAD. So there would be an option to trace here. I could kind of start tracing out the different outlines along here, but in this case, they're in CAD. So what I can do is I can extract them from the CAD file. This would be the same process for extracting PDF vectors. So you click on Add from File, and you can either browse for a CAD file, you can select site plans that have already been added. So I'm going to select this uh, Dingley Dell example here. And so we get presented with the CAD viewer. How this works is you set a sample of what you want to extract and the, the program should be able to detect from various filters from your selection, like the line color, the line weights and the layers in what kind of entities you, you know, what kind of entities are similar in the program and it can usually bring in the data that's similar, um, which is what you want. So in this case, FY select the contours, it picks up all the sort of gray, similar line weight uh, contours in the same layer. Um, so it's picked up those contours there. So that's uh, great. We just click OK. And now we're ready to start generating the existing surface. So we click OK. And then it's always good to go into 3D. So you click on this uh, little icon down in the display panel go into 3D orbit and you can see it's quite a flat surface that we've got there. That's all so far so simple. Um, it's always worth saving, like saving multiple versions um, for any project. We always say uh, try and save on a cloud storage like OneDrive or Dropbox or Google Drive and also do different revisions. So let's say I'll call this uh, revision two. OK, so now I'm going to go back to the slides to just talk a tiny bit about uh, the way Kubla Cubed works in its phases. For those who are unfamiliar with this, like Kubla Cubed has a, a like key technology, which means uh, you can do calculations between two surfaces in a cascade. So you start with your existing, just a single surface, and then you can have the second phase can be the, the ground surface that you've defined and another proposed. And then what you can do in the next phase is you can do 
another one. So that's another comparison of two, and then you can just go on, on and on. So in this case, we can see it's utilized to do backfill. So we've got existing phases. Uh, phase one is an excavation, and phase two is a backfill. And then we could go and excavate from here, and it would be excavating from that in the third phase. It would excavate from that backfilled level, not from uh, either the existing or phase one. So the proposed of one becomes the ground of the next. Uh, so that's kind of critical un to understand when it comes to these projects. So in terms of house building projects, you might have a strip phase of the project that needs to be in its own phase, and you might have a demolition uh, phase of the project. So in this case, there isn't any demolition mark, but there might be a strip. Um, but I will do a demolition anyway, just to show you how that would work. But um, often you won't have demolition if it's on a greenfield site, but you also, if you do, I'll just show you how you would deal with that. So, so let's pretend we have like a, an existing building there that we have to break out with a reduced level dig. So I'll just rename this second phase to demolition. And we're used to use one of these two elements, either reduce, which will take the levels and reduce them down. You might use that if you were milling uh, paving, or you can use platform to, to break down to a, a certain level. So say if the, the ground here is 170, so if you wanted to go down to 179, we'd put a platform here uh, of 179. So that's removing it, say an existing concrete foundation. Um, uh, now, one thing I always, one tip I always give uh, in regard to demolition is that in, over here there's a mode, and if you set this to cut, it will make sure that your demolition phase isn't doing any filling, which is obviously not not what you usually should be doing in a in a demolition phase. You might also have a requirement to remove stockpiles using the same sort of techniques, uh, so that's something that you might be doing in the demolition phase as well. So. I might reduce that down to one, was it 178 we had decided? Is it 170? So no, I've got that wrong, 168. The reason it's showing nothing is because it's in cut only. It would usually be showing fill, but because uh, it's in cut and only it's showing nothing. So there we go, we've got some a demolition. If we put elements over the top of this, they would replace this. What we want to do is do another phase. That, that, that phase of the um, surface is done, and we want to compare from those levels to say a strip level or subgrade level. So what we need to do here is a strip phase. And there's a question here about whether we do strip, of whether we're doing a strip over the um, demolition or whether we're going to exclude the demolition. So I'll just show you both uh, techniques. So let's say with a strip, you're usually doing a like kind of, um, it's usually easiest to just trace. Um, so again, we're using the reduce element. So click, there, there. So we're just going over the general area. And the default here is set to one, so we'll set it to something a bit more realistic, like 0 0.2. That's 200 millimeters. If it was set to imperial, which you can set uh, here, this would be any could either be in inches or feet, but it's the same the same stuff. So what what we're doing there is actually we've done the demolition, and now we're stripping from the ground levels plus the demolition levels down further 200 millimeters but we might say oh we don't actually want to do that demolition once we've done the demolition that's leaving we're just going to strip around it uh, so what you would do in that case is you would copy the demolition area into into the strip and this is where um so i've just gone i've just selected that element there and i've gone edit copy and then I've cancelled to go back out of it. Then I'm going to go into my strip phase and going edit. And then I'm in this outlines bucket. We'll talk a bit about that later. And then we go paste. So what it's done here is it's put an outline within an outline. And that, that tells the computer, the computer detects that and knows that this is a, a punch out, we call it, rather than a, another island of earthworks. So it, that happens automatically. You don't have to set this one to inner and that one out. So the computer knows algorithmically that, that, that this one is contained in that one. Uh, sometimes in the past people would go in, around and back out again, uh, but and, and that still works obviously, but now it's not necessary. You can have this, so I'll show you what that looks like. So we've now got our existing demolition, and then we've got a strip around everything apart from the demolition. And now we're ready to go onto our proposed levels. And you can see that the ground surface has got the strip in it, and it's also got the 
demolition in it. Uh, we don't actually have a demolition in this project, so I'm just going to um, delete that uh, for now. Uh, so we just have the strip because that was just a demonstration. Um, I might also delete that punch out from the strip because that that's not required either. OK, so now we're ready to move on to the proposed, and this is where things get a bit more complicated. I'll, I'll return to the slides. So the approach that we use, there's two approaches in Kubla Cubed um, for adjusting from finish levels down to uh, formation levels or subgrade, which I've talked about before. There's the, the offset method, uh, which is you break your site into different elements and you adjust them using uh, a Z offset, so you move the elements up and down by Z. Um, another method is to do everything in one set of contours and, and reduce them with with different reduce elements. Um, but in this this thing, we we advise to use the offset method. Um, it just creates nicer models and is easier to manage in this scenario. So, what you need to do is to break your site up into different uh, sort of assets. We call them sometimes. So in this case, gardens, building pads, garages, shared drives, roads and pavements. So it's not always obvious how to break the site up like this, but you need a different element for different uh, thicknesses. Uh, so say if your tarmac, if your shared drives are a different thickness to your road, you need obviously a different adjustment. So they need to be, there can be only one adjustment per element. So obviously that separation is required. And also in the report, uh, you get separate cut and fill for each um, for each element so you also have to consider that if you want for instance um the, the parking areas to be separate from the the garages then you obviously need them in a different element if they had the same makeup you could put them in the same um the same element but it's best to separate them out like this another slight advantage you get is if there's any problems building the tins um which in very complicated projects with say 50 building plots you can get then it will report which one has the problem so that can be quite useful one thing that we say is the order matters the order is relates to which one will override which so if you're putting elements in the same phase they can actually override each other and in housing projects this can work to your advantage because you can just do the gardens as one um one large area and then you could just put the building pads on top and you don't have to cut around the uh building pads in the garden uh, because they will over the building pads will override those elevations and the same with the garages and the shared so using that approach you can save a lot of time so what you do is like we often describe it as a sort of painting analogy that if you're painting a motorbike the most efficient way to do it would be to spray the base coat and then add a, a further level of like bands color bands like maybe if you've got kind of a, a basic two-tone design and then you might add in more detail so in this example you can see you know if you were to take this color here and try and paint all those individual bits it's going to take ages to paint around all the detail it's much more efficient to paint paint the base and then do the next sort of band of detail and then uh this yellow part and then finally these small orange strips and then you might put more decals at the end rather than painting around the decals you know it'd be hopelessly it'd take maybe twice as long so we can sort of do that with the uh building um housing estate kind of examples in particular when it comes to the gardens so we sort of this is synonymous uh, is similar to a like gardens or soft landscaping often and then we're overriding you know these different uh, building pads etc uh over the top uh so the layer has to be established a tiny bit like this the gardens it usually be at the top and then you go down um so when it comes to adjusting each element so you use this kind of offset that's in the program which allows you to move uh, an element up and down in the z-axis so you're just putting a negative uh, offset here so this is negatively offset by minus 350 millimeters this one by c0.5 so it's a bit complicated to understand from just that explanation so i'll go through the full project from now on i'll rename this phase to uh podcast works or maybe subgrade I'll start by taking off a couple of things that are over here. So here we've got a detention pond, which we'll start with, which is kind of simple. Um, so here I'll be just, just demonstrating how we, we sort of break it down into different um, objects. Like in the other approach, you would define all these contour lines and all the other contour lines and points in a single feature surface and then reduce. But in this one, we're going to be just doing that little section as a detention pond 
on its own. So we click on the feature surface because it's got contours. We have to use a feature surface. I click on the contours bucket. It's quite easy to kind of select the wrong bucket and then try and import or trace. But here we're, uh, we're not going to be tracing these, so we're going to extract from CAD. So we click on that one. It will have the selection that you had last time. So in this case, the existing contours. You click clear, set from sample. I'll zoom in on the detention pond. Um, and I select those uh, contour lines. And they should all be in the same layer in this case. Uh, and there's a certain line weight. Uh, it, it's brought those all in together. So that has worked quite well in, in this one. So click OK. And we also want a boundary. So all feature surfaces have their own unique boundary. You don't want to use the same boundaries you used and cover the whole site. They need to have this you know, tight boundary of where for each for each one. So this one, there is actually a boundary sort of marked in grey, and it gives me the sort of opportunity to introduce another boundary outline. So in this case, and with ponds, it's a good idea to have the outline set to matched ground. So it's like actually stuck to the ground rather than um, rather than the other one, which we had all extrapolate. If it was extrapolate, it would just take this inner contour level which you don't necessarily want. What we want is for the outline to be pinned to the ground. So you can't import ground lines from CAD directly because CAD doesn't have the concept of as, as a ground line. So you have to import it is in this case, it's coming as a 2D sort of polyline. So it loads as a fixed level. So we change the selection to use ground level. And then when we click OK, we should say that the outline is pinned to the ground. And then we've got the, uh, the contours uh, sort of like cutting into creating the excavation there. Uh, so we'll rename this one Detention Pond. We do, you don't necessarily often have an offset or an adjustment uh, from finish levels down to formation level. Uh, with the with Detention Ponds, you might, if there's a thick liner, you might want to uh, do that adjustment. So we'll just put in something um, small here. Um, so it's always best to remember it needs to be negative. So I put minus 0 0.2. That, that's the stormwater pond. So that one uh, is nice. So we'll go on to another simple example, this cricket pavilion here. Uh, we've got uh, 170.3 finish levels. So in this case, we'll use a platform, uh, just like a flat uh, level. Uh, so we just trace over the boundary. It's the kind of same idea. So you know, feature surface if you've got contours and points and break lines and such. But if it's a simpler, uh, sort of primitive, like flat, a plane or a slope, there is actually options in Cube Cube to do those uh, basic ones, which can be a bit more efficient. So I'll create that one. I set to 170.3. And then it's the same process. We'll be going through this quite a few times. So uh, we'll change the name. So the name isn't just nice to have in the program itself but it's also for when you're doing the reports these these element names get fed into the reports and spreadsheets so it's important to spend that time uh, so you just double click on the text and it should uh, be renamed so we do change this to fine option to level and offset and so we go minus 0 0.3 in this case um, we adjust that down from its finished levels so one way to check make sure you've typed it in correctly because one mistake that's quite easy to make is this negative uh, it's accidentally put a positive 0 0.3. So to kind of just do a reality check, you can just hover your mouse over and you can see that the proposed levels here are actually showing as 170 now because they've been adjusted from the 170.3 down. And that spot check is useful to do. You can also do a cross section, which can be another thing that can give you um, a view of like the elevations that is maybe easier to check for mistakes and stuff. We'll also go through at the end how to do some some additional checks, but I thought I'd just mention those there. So one one other kind of challenge we've got, which is quite common, is is one here, which is a car park parking lot, and it's got points along the perimeter. So it's not similar to, I mean, it's similar to the uh, detention pond in some ways, but it's not pinned to the ground. It's actually these are the points to the perimeter it needs to be joined to the uh, ground from those points. So we could either there's a couple of different approaches in Cube Cube. So we use a feature surface for this one as well. And it's another outline type that we'll go over, which is a varying levels outline. So that's like an outline where you can put points along the perimeter. There is another one called extrapolate, which would allow you to draw sort of a floating line and you could just put points inside the floating line 
or brake line. So that is another option, but um, fixed levels isn't going to work because that would be like a, a flat one and ground one isn't going to work. So that's just going to pin the outline to the ground. So we'll do the varying levels. So you just, as you're going, you just type in uh, the elevations like so, so 117.95. If you don't know one, so like there's nothing marked there. If you just press enter uh, or click next, and leaving the box blank, it will actually interpolate from its name from the neighbours from the ones that you have put in. Uh, I heard that neighbours is actually <laughs> finishing after some decades, which is very sad. But uh, <laughs> that, I don't know why that made me think of that. Uh, okay, so one seventy point nine four and one seventy. 170.95. Um, you can also click backspace if you make a mistake and it will go back a step. Uh, there we go. So, so this process is, is actually quite common with, with especially car parks and roads. You In this plan, you can also see the roads are defined in a similar fashion. They've got uh, points along their perimeter. Uh, so 0, 2, uh, 171. And then uh, I'll just do the last two quickly. So, if you wanted to define this in CAD, it would need to be a 3D polyline. Uh, the, the 3D polylines can't be kind of have floating levels in CAD. So, one thing that you can do is set them. Set the ones you want to be floating on interpolated to minus nine nine nine, and then just clear all the say minus nine 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 ones. We're going to have a filter for doing that automatically in a future version, um, but for now you have to use that technique. So we'll, we'll drop this down um, as well. So we've got the same process, exactly the same process for this uh, parking. Um, we're going to name it. Uh, And we're going to do the adjustment. Another thing to think about, so if you zoom in here, is you've got this side batter. So this is automatically set to one in one, but with the side batter, so we've got one in one there, and these don't intersect much, so it doesn't matter. One real challenge for the calculation engine is, is joining side batters together. So in general, with these elements, you'd want a very, you'd either want, you'd want it to be vertical, so they, there's a, the chances of them intersecting are very low. Um, well, vertical isn't as reliable as setting them to 0.01. So when we're doing the housing plots, I'll show you just, it's actually better for the engine for there to be a slight uh, angle rather than vertical triangles are probably the most challenging ones to build the mesh with. So I always recommend using this trick of putting 0.01 as it kind of, it, it's kind of more or less vertical. Um, one in 0.01 angle is gonna look vertical and, and calculate extremely similar. But um, it actually is is more kind of reliable in terms of building the tins. So I'll just go through that now. So now we have to do the housing plot. So the, the natural thing to do would be to do a platform, but because we want to do them all in one, we're going to use a feature surface which allows you to use a fixed level outline. A platform they would all have to be at the same level, which obviously the plot plots aren't. So we'll click on the feature surface, and like each each house is like a different level. So like to do them all in one element, you, you can only do that in a in a feature surface, even though intuitively it feels like you should be using a platform for this. If it was just one on its own or two at the same level, you would use a platform. But um, so we could trace obviously with a fixed level outline. So that would be uh, this one, and you would just go through tracing all the individual outlines. Um, but because we've got this one in CAD, we're going to click there, uh, select there. Clear the selection that is already on there, and I know select in this case the outer line, which should be that one. Okay, so that looks good. Uh, bring it in, click OK, it triangulates and creates its own surface. So this is where we're going to turn off these side butters, so I can actually turn them to 0 0.01. So they're extremely steep, or what I was saying, and then we rename name the element building pads. And we change this level and offset to minus 0 0.3. Uh, maybe 2.5 in this case. 
So you can always go back and change the offsets, and that's the good thing about the system. Like if you find all your building pads in this one and they've got a joined offset, then they, they're all adjusted at once. Now, if I was to do them in individual platforms, for instance, you'd have to go through changing each one, which is a bit of a pain. Now, uh, there, there is some other advantages to splitting them up. Some people might split them up into the individual pods. They might do the groups. So that's another option. You might do building pads, pod one, pod two, pod three, and then gardens, pod one, pod two, pod three. The main advantage is if there is any problems with building the mesh, it will actually tell you which one is having the error. So it's a bit easier to like detect. So if you've got a very large one, like 100 houses, you might consider breaking them up into pods because you'll get error in building building pads pod two. So you can go in and, and see like how you can fix that, which is often a matter of moving things around a bit. Uh, so you're not getting so many of those side intersections uh, that I mentioned. Um, so we've got the building pads in there, so we're ready to go on to our next thing, which is the garages. So the garages might have a different markup to the building pads, and we want to have a separate cut and fill report for the garages. So I'm going to uh, put those in uh, a different feature surface. So the garage is exactly the same. So I click on the add from file here. And it's still got the building pads in the selection, so I'm going to clear that selection and set the garage lines. There you go. And there are fixed level outlines in the CAD. We've noticed some more people are using CAD, like in the last couple of years, it's becoming more popular. Um, there was a time when all projects were PDF, um, and now slowly CAD is becoming more uh, popular. So Autodesk CAD is obviously the main program often people use, but there's also Bricks CAD, your draft site, and some cheaper alternatives. So it's worth sometimes investing some time into to learning CAD, but um, you don't actually need CAD to be able to use CAD files in Kubla Cube because we have the tools to import, but it is useful to have a viewer like Autodesk TrueView or one of the budget ones sometimes to make some amendments, etc. Uh, okay, so these are our garages. So at the moment they have a one in one side butter, which is uh, it, it, these scenarios are very difficult for the engine to build, which is where there's a very small gap between two entities and it's trying to build a one in one batter down to this one. Uh, and, and often that, that's a real challenge. So this is why that we set these sides to vertical in this scenario. So I set that to 0 0.01. We probably should see that it, it should calculate, fingers crossed. There you go. So we also like the same as before, uh, we set this one to uh, garages and we leaven an offset and then offset this by uh, similar to the housing, but maybe a bit less. Okay, so the next thing to do is the shared drives. Uh, so the shared drives are here um, and they're slightly different. They might have a slight slope. So we're not gonna be using the fixed level outline like we were for the building pads and the garages because they're not flat. And we're gonna use the varying level outlines. It's similar to we did in the car park. Like this is quite common that on plans, the garages and the, the shared drives don't have levels. You have to kind of, you know, work them out or kind of those assumptions made that the garages might be a certain amount below the building pads and the shared drives have, you know, they're, they're similar, they'll step down from the garage and then they meet the road line. So you often have to kind of, sort of like guess this or estimate what these elevations are and you quite frequently might be tracing that. Um, in this case we've traced the varying level outlines in CAD because it would take so long uh, as 3D polylines. So I'll click on a feature surface. Now with the outline selected I'll click on here and we're going to grab, we're going to clear the selection which is the garages and we're going to select this it's actually a 3d polyline in cad so they come in like this they also have to be closed that's true for all the outline types um they need to be closed 2d polylines closed 3d polylines uh, it's common like kind of mistake where people send us files that they can't extract from and they're not closed so okay so when we zoom in we can see that a bit like the car park here we've got points along the perimeter of the shared drives and because they're being brought in from cad if we were trace, to trace these, the middle point here, for instance, it wouldn't have to need an elevation, but because they're brought in from CAD, 3D polylines don't have that not set kind of thing. 
we are looking to have a way to set a value to be not set um, in a future update, but for now, they'll always come in uh, like this. So, so that's fine, um, but it's just something to be aware of. So we click OK. And we'll set this to 0 0.01 uh, to remove the side butter. And set the adjustment, the negative adjustment, so minus 0 0.3. Okay, so it's looking good so far. Might just quickly save it again as a different revision. And we're ready to do the gardens. One approach with the gardens would be to trace all these little interior areas. That would be kind of an intuitive thing to do because uh, you don't want the gardens intersecting with all of this and overriding them. But because we've established that you can actually override elements, it's much better for us to do like a, the gardens big block and then override them with these other elements. Now, the, the order, the priority order is the top one is got the least priority and the one you've done last has the top priority so they kind of override downwards so it kind of makes sense to do the gardens first the reason i don't do that is because uh it's kind of easy to see if you do the other assets first like now we're nicely looking at all the the stuff uh in isolation with the gray background if you had uh if you did the gardens first they would have their own cut and fill and you'd be replacing sections it would work fine, but it, it's just kind of a bit nicer to do like this. So it's another tip to kind of leave the gardens to last and then you'll have to move them up. So I'll show you that process. So we'll go and add gardens. So we could, in theory, do the gardens over kind of the whole disturbance area and, and do all the points in the gardens. We're doing the roads in this project, so even the roads would override uh, that. But I'm going to do them in just their individual pods, uh, which is another approach potentially better if you can have the time to trace the outlines for each kind of pod. So we, what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to take the inner road line uh, to use as the garden line. And a bit like with the uh, pond, um, we want this garden line to actually match to the ground. So I don't need this one because that's not actually part of the uh, uh, proposed disturbance area. So I'm going to just focus on these uh, one, two, three, four, five garden pods, and they're defined with points. Now, gardens can often be defined with different things, like you might have more of a terrace design where you'd use like closed contour lines to, or there could be retaining walls, which you'd use break lines for. Uh, this one is quite a common and simple approach where we've got just uh, points. So I'll extract those as well. Now, uh, before I do that, I should set all of these to ground level. They've come in from CAD, so like I mentioned, they will be either fixed level or varying level. Uh, so for the, the options ground levels and extrapolate, you need to um, set them after import. Uh, so just double click there. Okay, so they're all done. We just need to bring in the points. Yeah, so I've grabbed all those points. Okay, so now we're ready to triangulate. So uh, what you'll see initially is, is what we expect, which the gardens are gonna be overriding all the elevations that we've put in the work we've done so far, which is not what we want, obviously. So I'll just put uh, on in the, the garden. So the gardens in this case haven't got any offset. They're just at the elevations that have been input. So you can see the gardens are there, but they've basically obliterated all the work that we've done. If we had them on another phase, they'd be potentially cutting from that. But because they're on the same phase, they're over and they intersect, they actually override all these element elevations. So we actually want the opposite. We want all the other stuff that we've done to override uh, the gardens. We don't have to worry about these three because they'd actually intersect with the garden. So we just need them above the the building pads, garages, shed drives in this case. So we'll move the gardens uh, up there. So you often have the soft landscaping um, like this at the top and then all the other sort of hard uh, landscaped elements uh, over the top just as a matter of course. So um, 
I might move that to the top and then you can see how it's starting to shape up that you've got the gardens and then all the building pads elevations have overwritten the gardens that we don't so we don't it saves us tracing all those gardens which can be a real pain and was something that you had to do in previous versions of the software in, in order to get a separate breakdown for different elements since Cube Cube 2021 which we'll go through in the report you can actually uh, get the breakdown of the different assets with using this method so it's a real advantage so I'll quickly uh, save that and then we'll go on to the final thing uh, which is the roads So with the roads, uh, there, there's multiple ways of doing roads in Cube the Cube. So it sort of depends on what data you have. So in this one, it's been done a bit like the car park that we talked about initially, which is there's different um, points along the, the road perimeter, uh, which we take off. And there's no center line in this case. So sometimes you have a center line, uh, which might be just points along the center, which is best to do as a brake line. So if you do a brake line for the center, a brake line is like a contour, but can have different elevations along its length, a bit like the varying level outline, uh, but it's not an outline. It's just a sort of internal feature surface. So you do a brake line for the center and then you do an extrapolate outline for the perimeter and it should like kind of work out the perimeter based on the internal things. So that's one approach. This approach is possibly the best way, which is we've got a perimeter. Uh, points you can even have an, the perimeter points and a brake line in the center which will create, you can use to create a sort of um, drop off from the center um, so we'll, we'll just show you in this case we've just got the perimeter points the road is actually this internal this inner one and the, the footpaths slightly overlap the road this is recommended for this technique because you get kind of a clean seam and the footpaths will actually override the elevations on that road a bit like the way the road is constructed that it will be under tucked the footpath uh, it's the same in this if you do the road slightly wider than the uh, sort of going underneath the footpath then um, you'll create a nice seam there without having to snap and it's actually a bit a bit like the 0 0.01 uh, trick it actually it means there's less build problems if you do that so you don't have to do that but that's uh, one thing that we recommend so I'll just quickly do it in a feature surface so we're going to be importing these levels from CAD uh, so in CAD they would need to be uh, 3D polylines uh so it's this inner line here uh i'll just copy that bring that in you can see uh what what's happened here is similar to the punch outs that we did with the demolition there's an outer outline and then these inner outlines are kind of like negative so they're like punching out so but you just bring them all in as a set that compute will kind of work it out so click ok and then we've got the roads and then finally, so it's exactly the same as the others, we give it uh, a name. So and also um, we can put an offset for the road, which might be quite a big one because of the build up of a road surface. And then the footpaths obviously are in a different one because there'll be a different uh, a different build up. So there is a new tool in Cube Cube 2021, which makes generating footpaths quite easy. It's called the offset tool. So it's like similar to a CAD offset command, if any of you are familiar with that. I'll show you that we haven't got time to do it. But if you imagine you've got a road perimeter with points along, uh, you would just offset it up and in and then offset it back out. So that's a sort of standard way of creating a footpath using a road center uh, with an offset tool. So you do it in CAD. We've done it in CAD in this, but I'll show you where that is. So we're uh, select a feature surface. So it's it's here. So this offset tool comes up. Uh, you can also offset other things like brake lines for doing retaining walls, but it's really useful for doing uh, footpaths uh, around a road or footpaths around a building. But because there's so many here, you'd have to do it for all of these different ones. We've done it in CAD for now. Uh, so I add the footpath. So select that uh, one there. I think uh, if you just get some of it in the initial sample, like in this case, I've got, I think I've got the outer row, uh, footpath, but not the inner. Uh, I'll go there and select the inner one. And so when we zoom out now, we can see we've got the whole thing. Okay, so click OK.
like even with CAD, because because the information in the CAD file is, is quite often not as nice. This is obviously a, a CAD file that we've created, so everything's important fine. Roads quite often and footpaths quite often have to be traced, like just because they're they'll be is 2D polylines of maybe points and there won't be a continuous 2D polyline, they'll be broken up. So you often, if you don't have CAD, you'll maybe need to trace over it in Cooper Cubed. If you do have CAD, you can actually maybe uh, redraw the line or draw over the top of it on a separate layer. Because CAD in some ways has like a very good snapping tools in it and cool tools because it it's the main you know purpose of CAD. Um, so some people prefer that approach, but if you don't have a CAD license, uh, you can always uh, trace it in Cubic Cubed. I'll just put an offset on the uh, road here. So after this, we'll be going through some exports. I don't have time to like go through everything, but I'll just touch on some of the main uh, things that you might want to uh, check with your exports. You can export drawings, CAD data, um, cross sections even. Um, so we'll have a look at how that looks. So um, there's the final uh, thing. We've got the roads, the pavements, the building pads, the shared drives all defined. Um, I'll just name this uh, final one to footpaths. And we're finished there. What the first export that I tell people when you're doing a project like this is to go into the crate spreadsheet and input data. This is a check of the data that you've input into the project. So this is a great opportunity to check not only the uh, side batter to make sure that it's set to 1 in 0 0.1. So you can see I haven't actually set the road surface to 1 in 0 0.01. It's calculated anyway, it, it's fine. It's generated the tins, but if it wasn't doing, you could go and be like, oh, okay, uh, I haven't done the 0 0.1 in 0 0.01 thing. Um, and it also check all of these to make sure that they're right, because you should have on a separate sheet at the end of the project what the build up is. So you say, is it 200 millimeters for the tension ponds? Um, OK, and these should also be all negative. So as well as your spot checks, uh, it's a good idea to exaggerate and view it in 3D. Um, and the cross sections, that is also a really good one for checking just the inputs in a, in a spreadsheet, which is a bit easier than double clicking on these individual ones. and I check it, especially when you have a lot of things. If you had if this is split up by pod, you would have uh, pod pod one build and pass pod two build and pass pod three garden uh, garages pod one pod two etc. So you could have like quite a large amount of elements there. So the other thing is obviously the earthworks estimation. Um, if you click on earthworks estimation here. Um, and this is like one of the key things about this process, what makes it um, work really well is that we've got a breakdown, not all, not just all the earthworks in this phase. We've got the strip tab and the demolition tab down here. Uh, we've got all the all the earthworks in each phase. We've also got the bulk earthworks here. It's got a breakdown by element. So it says breakdown by element, lowest element reports in intersecting areas. So that's really key. Because not only do the elevations of these uh, items that override the gardens, but they also they report the cut and fill, where there would be cut and fill in the gardens if they weren't overwritten. It, in the area where the building pads override the elevations, that claims that cut and fill in that area. So that really is important for this for this this sort of workflow to work. Another thing to look out for, apart from the volumes and the sort of net uh, cut and fill for each element is the 2D areas, which you can use to then calculate your surface material estimate. So you should have a, a 2D area, which is like uh, calculated from a sort of plan view top down. You've got a 3D area, which is perhaps more accurate for, for calculating surf, certain surface materials. So you can just multiply that with the thickness to find, to do a separate spreadsheet of how much for each material. Obviously you might have different strata in the material, so you'd have to do 0 0.2 for this, 0 0.1 for this, etc. So uh, there's that. There's also um, obviously exports to CAD, um, drawings where you can see the cut and fill maps. But another one that is quite useful to look at uh, with these ones is if you go into the Earthworks report, uh, which exports the same thing as we were looking at, but in a Word document, which is, is kind of a good base to use to, before sending to clients. So if you do the export report, you can then use that as sort of base, like you can do cross-section diagrams, 
uh, and copy and paste them in. You could maybe take some screenshots and copy and paste them in and write some of your own notes. Um, so but it's good to work with that base because it's got different chapters for each phase. So we've got all we've got the existing on that first page, the strip, and then th then this diagram is really uh, useful. It's got like the kind of different areas uh, in the site, which can really help like kind of establish that kind of dynamic of overriding where the garden areas will be just showing in the areas that aren't overridden uh, rather than over the whole thing. So that that's really useful. And we're actually going to enhance that in a, in a separate uh, PDF diagram. So it's more more sort of like like a bigger diagram because this one is really useful in these kind of scenarios. OK, so that's the end of that, that project. And I know just uh, show one other workflow which we didn't we don't have time to go through, which is similar to this. So what people used to do in 2019, because this breakdown before it would just cluster everything into, if you did like this, it would work, but it would cluster everything into the same cut and fill report. And people used to break it down into different phases. So you still will see those kind of projects and it's still a valid way of doing a project. If you do them in different phases though, you have to be aware that if you did the gardens first and then the building pads, the building pads could cut from the garden elevations, which isn't what you want. So you've got to basically you can't take advantage of that uh, process of overriding. Uh, you have to actually cut out when you're doing the guns, you actually have to cut out the other things. But you could do that by using copy and pasting. Uh, for, in the gardens case, you could you could copy and paste the outlines for the building pads and put them in the gardens, perhaps set them to extrapolate. They would work nicely so that that that's another workflow that you might you might see a project that looks a bit similar to this, where it's like kind of everything's cut out. Um, now, what we say, like some of our customers prefer this approach because it's actually kind of nice in a way you've got each, all of the assets uh, separated into different uh, amounts uh, on each phase. Uh, so here I'm looking at just the garages, just the roads, and it, it works fine. There's nothing wrong with it. You might have the roads and the footpaths in the same uh, phase, and then the other things separated as well. The only thing is with the soft landscape areas, you then have to cut out the other things. And you can either create a separate project at the end and copy and paste them all into one phase. So you have the sort of, you have the visualization of the whole cut and fill as well as the individual breakdowns. This is fine, it just takes longer. So uh, we recommend doing the main one that I have talked through today. Um, but you might see projects like set up like this, or you might prefer to set them up like this. There's nothing wrong with it. The just key thing to remember is that you're gonna have to uh, cut out when you do the gardens. You might want to pin the outline to the ground, but for in here, because the points aren't really designed to be pinned to the ground on the internal areas, you might want to either trace the elevations of the base of the, or set the elevations of the base of the buildings, or set them to extrapolate and have them interpolate from the points. Uh, so it's a bit fiddly from that perspective, having to do the gardens with all the cutouts. So that's why the other one is, is superior in my opinion, and also, the project shows you the full cut and fill map for all the proposed in one in one sh shot, which is often what you need. OK, so um, that's the end of that uh, presentation. I hope it's been useful. Uh, if we've got some time for any questions, if there's any of you who want, have anything specific to ask about that. What happens if the points on a CAD are all zero or they come through at zero? OK, so the, these points have Z value. So what if they come up through at zero? So one of the options uh, that you will get, uh, which we can sometimes do is um, if you click on here and set from this sample. So in this case, it's detected that the Z have elevations, so it's not needed. So it's gone. It will take the elevations from the Z position, but there are other options. There's nearby text. It can take the, the Z from nearby text. So that's sometimes an option, although with that, you have to be quite careful because it's obviously it's just proximity. So in this case, it could maybe get eight because that's near. So you have to double check that it can be a real time saver. Um, other than that, I still probably would recommend extracting the points based on position and then entering the Z elevations manually because um, at least you've got the X, Y correct. Um, so uh, apart from that, like if it hasn't managed to extract, which we do get with PDF, sometimes we can detect the points, but they come through zero and there isn't any special tool. Uh, when it comes to control lines, though, there is a tool that we've got. Um, it's called set multiple elevations, and there's a video about that online. So if all of these were zero, I could kind of strike. Uh, so it starts 170 to 176. 
So you strike through a set of contours and you say it starts at 170.6, uh, the contour interval is 0 0.10, it's descending, and then it sets them all in one bulk. So with contours, you've got that option. It's got the set multiple elevation tools. With points, we've only got that nearby text algorithm for the moment, but we're always developing these kind of uh, technologies. We're working at the moment on the dash joining algorithms. So, you know, it's a challenge because PDFs and CAD and uh, there's no standardized way of setting contours or setting points. You know, everyone has their own slightly different methods. Sometimes they're in blocks, sometimes they're in crosshairs, you know, cross lines. Um, so we're sort of always trying to work on that. It's never going to be 100%. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Give the nearby text a, a go, but if not, you, you'll have to enter them like manually. Can you define um, the meaning use of the offset Z? So it, it's quite, maybe it's somewhat confusing. Um, we are thinking about changing the terminology. I'll, I'll go back to the slides to explain this because maybe I skipped over that quite briefly. So um this is just basically what, what you end up when you've defined contour lines or points or fixed level outlines all of these you create a tin surface and all the offset is basically the mathematical term is translate it's translating the whole surface up and down in the z-axis uh, move is maybe more of a layman's term it's just moving the surface so it's nothing more complicated than that so you could say oh why, why not just adjust each contour line you know by the z amount but it's like well you know, if you've got 100 contour lines and someone says, no, it's not actually 300 millimetres build up, it's uh, 250, you'd have to then go back in and make those adjustments. So this is a way of just kind of, uh, you define your surface and then you just move it down. So uh, it's not an offset in the sense of the CAD offset tool. We've also got an offset tool now. Um, so it's maybe there's a bit of a duplicate of naming. So think of changing this to like translate, which is the more mathematical term, but we'll see. Um, it's a bit awkward because we've got so much documentation that talks about the offset method, but um, yeah, that, there's sort of two different offsets in Cube Cube now. There's the offset tool, which is like a, a like the CAD offset command, and then there's the Z offset here, which is like moving things down. In the offset tool, you can also move contours and stuff up and down in the Z. Um, yeah, so it's a bit of a model, but you can see how it works here. So the gardens, they've got no offset, which is kind of typical. The building pads, 350 millimeters, and then the roads. Uh, 0 0.5, 500 millimeters. So each thing has a different set offset. So this is called the uh, uh, offset method for adjusting finished levels in your site plans to formation. Someone's anonymous has asked, any limitations on the number of elements in an earthwork project? Uh, not really. Uh, a lot of times these are quite difficult questions to answer because the limitation is often the hardware that you've got. Like this laptop I've got is pretty new, so it can handle a project probably twice the size or maybe three times. Uh, it also depends on like if you've got loads of site plans. There's no there's no hard limit, but if you had like a project with five different site plans stitched, um, CAD CAD a lot heavier to process than PDFs. That's like one tip that's useful to know. So you know it, it, it's just a like it's a sort of experimentation. You know sometimes we have a project where someone's got a huge amounts of points and then it can really bog down. Uh, we've seen ones where people have had a hundred plots, so that's fine. Um, even more than that, even maybe 200, it, it can do it. Although you maybe have to, you know, separate, rather than doing all the building pads as one, I'd probably recommend in that scenario to break them down into different pods. Um, so it's just a case of like kind of giving it a go and seeing um, seeing how you get on with that. Uh, I know that this year there's an Alder Lake, Intel Alder Lake CPUs, which are testing benchmarking a lot faster than the previous generation. So I think when those laptops come out, we're gonna get some, and I, we're hoping that it will be able to push the technology already a lot further. So we do some tests with ones that are 10 years old. They would they'd be able to do this, but they would you'd be looking at long calculation times. So um, that goes for one of the other questions as well. I think any limitations on the version of DWG format? Um, so Autodesk sort of maintains the DWG standard and DXF is the other one as well. So that we support those two. So we use a kind of alternative system, uh, which is a number of companies such as us and BrickCAD uh, and Carlson and, and, and some of the uh, sort of uh, perhaps competitors to, to Autodesk who do their own library of tools for reading DWGs and DXF. And I believe they try and support all, all the formats of DWG, DXF, um, but we don't write that component. 
we we are a member of this organization and we pay for the license to use that so we're a bit dependent on them but, but it does seem to work pretty well we used to have a lot of problems with uh, cad when we used another technology and now we've joined this uh, it seems to work well so i'd give it a go and if you get any other problems uh, chat to us and we'll, we'll have a look at it uh, so there was an interesting question from uh, Don. Is there a specific reason why you did a cricket pavilion as a, as a platform and the building garage as, uh, as a feature surface? Now, the platform is a flat level. The problem with it in terms of doing the garages or the building pads is it's a single uh, level. So because that's a single thing on its own, I could do it at the platform. But with the building pads, I'd have to do them with in loads of individual platforms and I'd lose that ability to adjust them all at once with one offset. Uh, it's just it's a limitation that we put into the program with it considering changing. We're considering having like, basically it being plural platforms rather than one plane. But when we do that, we can't go back because then all platforms, we break the kind of, you know, we have to really be sure that we want to do that and we need to have discussions whether a platform is going to be a plane at the same level or it can be multiple planes at the same level so for now it's like if you want to have say the building pads they're all flat but they're at different elevations so you can do different fixed levels within one elevations but with a platform you'd, you'd be doing different um different flat levels um i i kind of see the point i think it's it probably would be nicer to have the flat areas in have that icon the flat icon it would kind of make sense um so we are probably steering in that direction but uh, for now it's just that like limitation we've in the design um so if it's yeah if it's just one building if you've got a small residential site and you're just doing a basement or a building then you'll be using a platform but for these where you need to do loads and they're all different it's best to bundle them into a feature surface are the plot outline imported with elevations i finished levels so Yes, they are from CAD. So when I was importing those CAD outlines, they're 2D polylines and they have the finish level in the CAD file. So, you know, they wouldn't always, you sometimes get CAD files that are flattened, they're at zero, so you might bring them in. And so if you, we can also in our next release, we're, we're going to be able to extract them from Bluebeam, uh, hatches, they use hatches. And in that case, because it's a PDF, it's not going to have elevation, so you might have to set them. Uh, obviously, with this demo, I can, you know, uh, go through setting all these individual garage levels and elevations, which you often might have to do if you're tracing. Um, so we sort of set them in CAD. Um, CAD is a 3D format, whereas PDF isn't. So often you either have to use clever tricks like text matching uh, with a PDF or you have to uh, set them manually. Uh, Graham has asked, how would it work if there was a separate topo and, and site plan? So that's quite a typical scenario where you have uh the, the proposed on a site plan like this and then you have maybe the existing on another site plan and you can actually have way more things you might have the, the different areas the different makeups on another site plan so you might want to overlay them one on top of the other so the trick there the thing to realize is you can add as many uh site plans as you want and you can mix and match so you could have two cad ones and a pdf or you could have three pdfs and an image scan image so they'll come up as, as a list like this um if they're CAD and they're in the same coordinate space, they should auto align together. Um, that's one of the benefits of using CAD. If they're a PDF and a CAD, you'd need to align them together, or two PDFs, you need to align them together. And to do that, there is a um, align to two points tool where you kind of pick two points that match on both plans and you align them together. So basically, um, you align them one on top of the other. It's the same technique for, uh, for stitching, where you have to stitch different plans. You can also have the topo as a point cloud, um, as a text file. So that is also possible to import that in. Um, there's a video about that on YouTube, is importing point files into. Um, so if you can get the survey as an existing point file of the surveying equipment, then that can save you a lot of time as well, like either CSV or XYZ file. Um, so that's another one. But basically, yeah, that's all um, possible. Um, and you just, you can add multiple plans. We've seen projects with up to 12 different site plans. Obviously, there's a bit of impact on speed, so it's good to have a powerful PC before you do that. Uh, so someone's asked if we have a video on PDF tracing. We have another project which is related to PDF tracing, and I might redo this one on PDF tracing as well. If you go on our videos page on our website, we've got like uh, an example with tracing, an example with um, CAD uh, for a different project, which what we don't have at the moment is um, one for uh, vector extraction because we've only just released that kind of tool so we're going to be doing 
uh, more videos on that uh, later. So if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh, you might see that. Two people um, have asked about the sort of exports, the cut and fill exports or cut and fill maps that can be generated. So and on exporting services, deep topic, are, there, are they triangle surface or line work? So you can, you've got quite a few different options in the CAD data export. So here is the triangulations. You can export the actual surfaces. You can also export the input data. So that's the sort of contours and points that you've taken off. You can also generate contour lines. So basically the answer is both. You can generate contour lines um, over the site and you can generate gridded data. Um, and so someone else, is there time to talk about the cut and fill uh, map? So for the cut and fill map, you go create, probably the best one is create drawing PDF. And then you include triangulations, disturbance So Let's see what we want here. So yeah, you can you can export the cut and fill map to this PDF drawing. I might go to another one, uh, but you can export a, a cut and fill map to PDF, or there's the option of doing an image of your create drawing image as well, or PDF or CAD. Um, and you can also, with the CAD one, generate a grid of points, which are sort of colored based on whether the point is cut or whether it's fill. Um, but that's quite uh, sort of involved in itself. So if you go, um, I'll just show you the PDF one. So if you go create PDF, include triangulations. Uh, so click, I might generate comp, I might see if we can generate some contours over there, but it's not. So you can also include the line work here, include incline lines, include outlines for the different buildings and stuff. So I'll see what that looks like. So you often get a different page, so that's existing. So this is the, the proposed one. And you can also export this to CAD uh, with the cross sections and different things like that. So you can then do sort of further editing. Um, and you can also generate in this one, like I said, the gridded points with different, each point has a different elevation and the red ones are, are cut and the blue points are filled. So there's quite a few different options. We are actually gonna be working on that with a, a few different things uh, later on as well. One last question, someone said, can you bring in a triangulation file for the tin? So the answer is yes. If you go there, you'll notice that there's this triangle surface. So that's polyface mesh, tin, uh, stored in typically a DWG file or land XML, or you can even import one that's installed in another cube to cube file. Um, so yes, you can do that um, and they work fine. If, if you want to, if you've done your existing already in Autodesk, Simple 3D or another program like that, you can just bring in the tin to start working on. Okay, well, thanks for everyone for attending this talk. I hope it's been useful. If there's anything um, outstanding that you would want to ask or want some clarification on, uh, then feel free to um, send us a question in our support mailbox and um, also we've got the forums so uh, good luck with your house building projects and we hope to see you on the next one